you got into this uh, real with, with your with your pre presentation, but maybe you could tell us what you really think about the, the subject of obesity. Is it is it um, because these patients have uh, bigger hearts and bigger atria? Is it because there's associated hypertension, or is there a metabolic stew going on that creates a kind of an inflammatory substrate getting the issue of whether some atrial fibrillation is related to inflammatory milieu and uh, cellular effects? Uh, it's difficult to tease out uh, which of those are probably most important, but we do know that there's an we've reached epidemic proportions of atrial fibrillation, we're reaching epidemic proportions of obesity. Um, so, and of course, age is on the rise. So this is where the obesity uh, you know, thought first came about. Now to tease out whether it is the, which component with, that is associated with obesity is, is not easy, but the data does suggest that it, it's now pointing less towards the obesity per se, rather than the, uh, the left atrial dilatation and uh, the, the most recent data uh, about peri-adipose, uh, peri-cardiac um, uh, adipose uh, may be what is uh, even more important than the obesity per se from then local paracrine and inflammatory effects. But the, the studies are now raising those questions. So I think the next steps will be, okay, we've identified that pericardial adipose appears to be uh, quite important. And interestingly, as I mentioned, independent of left atrial dilatation. Now, one of the very few uh, implicated uh, etiologies that has, has appears to separate itself from that very important aspect of left atrial dilatation. So studies uh, are now underway looking at uh, the local inflammatory effects from that. Was that a potential target for therapy? In the well, that's interesting because uh, that, um, that uh, uh, meta-analysis, which I put up on, this, on a slide from 2008, uh, also looked at uh, uh, many more studies post-operative, uh, in, in post-op patients developing atrial fibrillation. And in those, they did not appear to find that in the short term that uh, uh, obesity was related to development of post-operative atrial fibrillation. However, one question does arise that if you do identify patients, now these were short-term follow-ups, if you do identify patients undergoing cardiac surgery, whilst you're in there, you peel away a bit of pericardial adipose tissue, then follow them up for a long time to see what would happen in that situation. Time for questions now for uh, any mm -hmm. of the for I have one comment for, for Bob uh, and then a question for Mr. Darber. The, the comment is, uh, do you think that the CHAD class 2 is so much more effective than CHADS because it picks up the non cardiovascular strokes as well because you put in the vascular components so that maybe you put it, you, you catch a lot of the high risk patients just because of high cardiovascular risk independently as well. That's just a comment. And the question is, uh, I think one, one important part we often miss is, is how important rate control is when you go for rate control. So we could we say, you know, that, okay, this guy is uh, permanent, uh, there's nothing, nothing we can do with it. How far do we uh, push for rate control? There are data showing, again, that if you're aggressive or not aggressive, that really doesn't really change the outcome. Uh, how, how true is that? So should I go first? Uh, well, no, I, I clearly um, a, a lot of the validation of the CHADS VASC has not looked only at stroke but also other thromboembolic uh, events which could in some cases be uh, vascular and vascular is in, in incorporated into the uh, CHADS VASC. So that could be a component. I, I think the, uh, however you look at it though, it, it is a more effective way of identifying the lower risk population uh, so that we're not uh, uh, withholding anticoagulant therapy for patients who may actually be at higher risk than we thought they were from the earlier CHAD score. And of course there are other risk formulas too, but the CHADS VASC is the one which uh, has been, had a lot of extensive validation and now incorporated in guidelines. 
Okay. Uh, so the question, sorry, let me just answer the second question. Um, I agree, I think uh, trials have clearly shown that an aggressive uh, sort of policy of keeping their heart rate between 80 and 100 versus 110 beats a minute, we used to traditionally think that, you know, the lower you can keep their heart rate, the better really, but certainly studies have not shown that as such. And I mean, I think that the sort of bigger question is really, what is it that makes the patients really symptomatic, right, even with rate control? So some of those patients, even though their heart rate was controlled at 90 beats a minute, average of 90 beats a minute with a 24-hour halter, they're still symptomatic, right? So I think we just don't understand what, is the, what it is about atrial fibrillation that makes patients symptomatic, really. And I think the strategy that you deploy or you, you, you use for a particular patient depends so much on their individual sort of symptoms, really. Uh, whether it's a rate control or rhythm control, really. So you have to treat their symptoms, and certainly that's, that's sort of my philosophy very much, really. I don't, I used to at one stage always do a 24 hour halter monitor after I put them on rate control, but now I go much more by their symptoms, really. And then, uh, and then if they tell me they have symptoms, then I certainly might do a 24 hour halter, right, to sort of see what their rates are doing, right. But if they're asymptomatic, I don't anymore, I have to admit. May I just, um, I'm sorry to just, I uh, wonder if you wouldn't mind if I add, uh, with regard to the Affirm and Race studies, we all know that the major limitation in those studies were in the rhythm control arm, a, a large proportion of the patients had their anticoagulation stopped because um, uh, the trial has felt, yes, they're benefiting, they're in sinus rhythm now, and we can stop the anticoagulation. And actually, a lot of them ended up with strokes okay. and that, uh, 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 skewed the mortality results. Yeah. That, that's an important point. Plus, most of my electrophysiology friends still tell me that these patients are better off uh, with a uh, rhythm control strategy for <laughs> lots of reasons. Not only because they want to have more business, it's also <laughs> because you know the concern about uh, atrial myopathy from the chronic tachycardia. And then we're seeing some patients where we think uh, the microregurgitation we're seeing is related to annular dilatation from chronic atrial fibrillation as well. So there, there may be other, other reasons why trying to maintain sinus rhythm, if it can be done safely, might be advantageous. Do you buy into that? Yeah. There's also the um, argument about uh, LV function and diastolic dysfunction giving rise to um, atrial fibrillation. So I think uh, when they lose, as we were discussing earlier, um, in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patients, uh, which was shown on, on, on the slide which you produced uh, uh, the data for a while back, that when they lose that kick, um, it can have a, a, a real uh, detrimental effect on their symptoms. But the other thing that we've sort of picked up, and I think a number of groups have now clearly identified, is that patients that undergo recurrent atrial affibrillation, right, have this syndrome of a, a stiff left atrium, and some patients are incredibly symptomatic, right? If they've had sort of multiple ablations and you've done extensive substrate modification, they are very, very symptomatic, really. And, and again, that sort of tends to sort of suggest that we should limit the amount of ablation we do in the left atrium, right? Well, that's a very good segue into where we're going to go tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just last uh, question, maybe I will ask to Professor uh, Yes, well, um, I didn't get into the other issues of these oral anticoagulants. There's, there's no remedy and there's no, no way of reversing the uh, effect of, of these drugs um, that we know of. It's, it's quite effective. It can be done, but it's, it's quite complicated. Uh, this is where having a drug with a short half-life is beneficial, and uh, perhaps the uh, Pixaban, um, which is a twice-a-day preparation, may be uh, more useful than Revaroxaban, but you look at the half-life, and it's not that different, so uh, I'm not sure that's really an issue. Um, I have uh, many of my patients now uh, with atrial fibrillation, lone atrial fibrillation, who are starting on uh, the uh, factor 10 uh, inhibitors which are available in, in the United States. Cost is a, is a major issue, uh, it's depending upon how one finances the medications. Uh, that could be uh, a, uh, an issue for you. Um, 
but uh, they are they are catching on, and certainly the patients uh, appreciate them. Uh, the Picatran does have uh, an issue also sometimes with gastrointestinal side effects. Uh, that, was, that was the first drug on on the uh, U.S. market, and therefore it did catch uh, uh, a foothold. Uh, the other drugs are beginning beginning to catch up. Uh, I just wanted to check in the same setting, uh, when patient has been ablated and patient remains in sinus rhythm, for how long do you wait or how long do you recommend to wait before you think of discontinuing anticoagulation? <laughs> That's going to be a question I'm sure we'll uh, talk a lot about tomorrow. Um, certainly in my practice, I look at their Chad's vast score, right, and I base my decision on stopping anticoagulation. I know some of my EP colleagues are much more aggressive about stopping anticoagulation, but I, I actually use the Chad's VAS score and base it on that. Typically, I would have them on for at least three months of anticoagulation. If they've got a Chad's VAS score of zero, then I, I'm very happy to sort of discontinue anticoagulation at that stage. I'm very conservative. If they've got a Chad's VAS score of one, I strongly recommend to them to continue anticoagulation. Yeah, I think <laughs> the guidelines at the moment support that. And um, there is one paper in JCE uh, suggesting that after ablation, risks go down. But that's, uh, that's one small paper. So we await uh, other larger uh, papers and data which will hopefully uh, intuitively support that. But we can't do so without that data going back to the race and affirm argument where anticoagulation will stop to, uh, uh, and it was uh, to the detriment of the patients. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the thing you've got to be incredibly careful of, and certainly I have sort of discussions with my colleagues as well who are very keen on discontinuing anticoagulation, but I think we've just got to look at the firm data to tell you that, I mean, majority of many episodes, one out of six episodes is asymptomatic, right? And I'm not sure about each practice, but we have a very sort of scheduled uh, regimen in terms of monitoring their atrial fibrillation. So we do seven day monitoring at three months and six months. And then only at that stage, if there's no atrial fibrillation, do we feel comfortable stopping the anticoagulation. If there's no other... Uh There we go. And for the discussion, I'm going to do what Sarvati does much better than I do. Uh, <laughs> to, uh, question. One more question, then we'll have a wrap-up. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Informative lecture. The question is, we did one study here in our center to uh, check the time of our therapeutic range we found that we are almost 69.7, almost 70 percent or is in that time of our therapeutic range. So do you recommend to shift the patient to the abogatrin or the or anticoagulant? Because still we are higher than rely, higher than rocket, higher than all trial done. So what will be with this? The mic was a little, I, I couldn't hear it perfectly. Please. The time of our therapeutic range in our center, we did one study, okay, just uh, a random sample will select 240 patients out of 1,000 patients in atrial fibrillation. With atrial fibrillation, we found the time of our therapeutic range is high, almost about 70%. So in this case, do you recommend to shift our patient to a neural anticoagulant or continue? So what I have done, um, again, cost is a consideration, but in patients where we have this discussion, if they're well controlled on, on warfarin, I see no reason to change at all. But I have other patients where they're never well regulated, or, or they, 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 they come in for a routine uh, INR check, and their INR is 4.5. You know, and nothing else is different uh, that, they, that they can think of. And then we, we change those, and now it's uh, 1.5. So there's this fluctuating uh, effect where we're constantly chasing ourselves. So in those patients where there is uh, Difficulty, they're outside the therapeutic range uh, many times, then uh, it's, it's easier to have a discussion about moving to one of the new agents. Um, when we're first starting, if the patient first comes in with uh, new, new onset atrial fibrillation, or at least be detected for the first time, the nice thing about the oral anti thrombin, anti PNA agents is that they, they work immediately. You don't have to worry about 
several days of, uh, uh, of Kumin. You don't have to worry about whether you should be giving a, a loading, uh, you know, and, and so it's, uh, it's sim simpler to start uh, with, with these new agents. So uh, they, they have become quite popular. Uh, Termaki does send his regrets. Uh, he's still uh, tied up with uh, Her Highness and the uh, genomic uh, discussions, which are, are very important for all of us. He will be with us tomorrow. Uh, he always builds in something through our program called uh, What Have We Learned? And uh, I think we've learned a lot already, and we're looking forward to learning uh, even more tomorrow. Clearly, there's a, a huge uh, a burden of uh, accumulation that uh, we see clinically, and the rest of the world is seeing also. Uh, there are genetic components that clearly are uh, lifestyle and uh, comorbidity components as well. And uh, we started to get into some of the treatment issues, antibiotics, but also rate and rhythm control. And tomorrow we'll get into more discussion about uh, some of these really exciting uh, issues of uh, imaging, uh, catheter regulation, surgical advances, and uh, uh, perhaps the future of treatment of our patients. So thanks for coming. Hope you can make it again tomorrow, same time at 11.15.